Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I will talk about um, joint work with Dima Rinkin. and my student, Marci Hablicek. And uh, the paper is on the archive. And this is the archive number. Let me explain the, the main object of study. So um, the, the setup is the following. You have some variety X, probably not projective, uh, affine or maybe some open subset in a projective variety. And you have a function F from X to, let's say, C. And you want to study the critical locus of F, which has already appeared in a couple of talks today. Um, and uh, one thing that you want to study is to study this uh, twisted Durham cohomology of X. So uh, for that, you look at the twisted uh, complex of X, which I will denote by omega dot of X with differential D plus wedge DF which is a complex that looks like omega zero goes to omega one goes to omega two and so on. And differential is you take the usual Duran differential, but you modify it by adding a wedge with DF. And it's very easy to check that this squares to zero, so it gives you a, di a new um, differential on this, on this complex. And what you want is to understand the, the twisted Duran cohomology, which is just, um, um, Ri gamma of this complex. <coughs> All right. So you would like to understand these cohomology groups. Um, they appear just as motivation. They appear in the study of the critical locus of F. Another place where they appear naturally um, is uh, people study often the category of matrix factorizations of this F, um, which is a model for the singularity categories of the singular fibers of F. And uh, it's reasonably easy to check that these cohomology groups play the same role. As they, are, they, they will compute the cyclic homology uh, of the category of matrix factorization. So they, they play the same role for the matrix singularity category uh, as the RAM cohomology would, would play for the usual, for, for a usual variety X. All right. Um, <clears throat> so a, a particularly simple example is, for example, is if F is zero, so if it does not play any role, then this uh, computes just the usual the RAM cohomology of X. And then if X were compact, we'd have a very useful way of computing it. If X is compact, the Durham cohomology of X, we have the Hodge theorem that this is the same thing as the direct sum over p plus q equals to i of hp of x omega q. Uh, this is the Hodge theorem, of course. And uh, my goal for today is to try to understand how to generalize this theorem in the case of twisted Durham cohomology. Now, um, one way you could rephrase this theorem is the following. 
Uh, no, sm uh, algebraic varieties. Uh, yeah, but maybe the are they holomorphic They are the, the sheaf, well, for me, they will be the sheaf of holomorphic differentials. And this is the algebraic Durham or twisted Durham cohomology. So here I'm taking, that, that's why I'm taking R gamma and not just gamma and then take cohomology. Um, we know from, at least in, in the case of, um, of algebraic, uh, I think in both, the, there's a standard result of Grothendieck that says that the R gamma of this computed algebraically is the same thing as the usual Durham cohomology of it. So you could, you could use the sheaf of C infinity, but of course that's not available in the algebraic context. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, so I, I yes, I'm happy. Um, yeah. All right. So now, so another way of writing this, um, this theorem, oh, sorry, yes, another way of writing this theorem is that we have actually two complexes. One is omega dot of x with differential d, and another one which is omega dot of x with differential zero, by which I just mean you put omega i in position i, but zero differential. And the Hodge theorem can be stated as saying that those two complexes have the same hypercohomology. When you compute the hypercohomology of this, you get exactly the Durham cohomology here. When you compute the cohomology of this complex, you get exactly this gadget. Right. So somehow the point is that you can get rid of the D and not lose, at the level of hypercohomology, you're not losing anything. So then there's a theorem, there's, for, uh, for, for this one, there is, uh, of course, a, um, so here, maybe let me emphasize that here X must be compact. Otherwise, this fails. So now, for, um, for the twisted case, there is a result which was uh, announced, I think, by Baranikov and Konsevich and then proved by Saba. Which says again that in the twisted case, the, uh, we need to assume that the critical locus of F is compact. Then um, these two vector spaces are isomorphic. R gamma of omega dot of x and d plus wedge ds and R gamma of omega dot of x just wedge ds. So you completely throw away the d, the non um, ox linear part of this complex. You you get the same hypercohomology. So of course, this is much easier to compute than this. However, in both cases, there is one part that's missing. So this is, this is the result of Baranikov and Konsevich says that if you have a variety over C or over a field of characteristic zero, you have a function f from x to C with proper critical locus over your base. Um, and you compute these two hypercohomology groups, you get the same dimension at least. They're finite dimensional and you get the same dimension. The one piece that's missing here is you would like some explicit calculation similar to this one and there is no similar calculation to this one in general. Um, so you don't, the, the good thing about this calculation is that it replaces a calculation of, of a hypercohomology of some complicated complex by just computing the cohomology of a bunch of sheaves. And you can think of this exactly as a, the fact that the spectral sequence degenerates. You obviously always have a spectral sequence going from these terms to these terms, the Hodge to Durham spectral sequence, but the statement is that it actually degenerates at some point you get uh, at E1 in that case. So the question that I'm going to ask is, First of all, do we, can we find an algebraic proof of this statement? This, sta this didn't have, I think, any proof, and this one, the proof is by analytic methods. 
Can we find an algebraic proof of this? And can we find one where we get some result, some calculation of this sort? So that will be my goal. Yes, I will mention. There is an algebraic proof of Vologodsky, so I will give a different proof, but in the same general spirit, by reduction to characteristic P, but also um, I will give a particular case in which, so our results give something stronger in the sense that with an extra assumption, you actually will get a formula of this sort. So a direct sum of computation of cohomology of a bunch of sheaves that you can explicitly calculate. Sorry? The compactness here? Yes, they are finite dimensional. So in fact, the way Saba states his theorem is that this and this are finite dimensional vector spaces of the same dimension. So somehow I feel that this is not very fair because there is no explicit isomorphism here. Sorry? Is there any kind of canonical isomorphism? Um, in the case that I will, in the particular case where we can prove it with our method, yes. But um, I'm not sure that explicit, I don't know if, I, if that means that I can write it down explicitly. There's a long sequence of isomorphisms, and some of them are quasi isomorphisms which go in the other direction. But All right, so now I want to <coughs> say that for this result, uh, the, there is a very nice proof, algebra, very nice algebraic proof of the Hodge theorem um, using characteristic P methods going back to Delina and Delosie. Uh, I think 1988. This was a fantastic idea. So let me maybe try to explain what their idea was. Here we have a complex of sheaves, but which is not a complex of OX modules because the differential D is not OX linear. Here we have a complex of coherent sheaves. We're in a much better behaved category. What you'd like to do is you'd like to do some modification to this so that at least it becomes a complex in some category of coherent sheaves. And in characteristic P, we can do this. So if X is uh, over a field K of characteristic, so let's say perfect field K of characteristic P greater than the dimension of X, um, then we have at our um, disposal, uh, we can use the Frobenius uh, morphism and the Frobenius morphism um, is a, the, the relative Frobenius is a morphism from X to a twist of X. This is X cross over K with K, where here this K acts on, on, on it by the usual piece power map. Um, this is a Frobenius. It's just the usual Frobenius map, just that you've twisted it so as to make it K linear. The usual Frobenius, the, the absolute Frobenius is not K linear. Um, and wha here's what Delina and Delosie prove. They prove, so Delina and Delosie prove the following statement, that if you take the, or the, the Durham complex of X, so with the nonlinear differential D, and you push it forward to, um, to X prime, which X prime is just another copy of X really because this ma the, the Frobenius map, because F the field is perfect, this map is an isomorphism, just not a K linear isomorphism. So the first observation is that if you push forward the, this complex, this becomes a linear complex. So this is always OX prime linear. This is because the, the nonlinearity part of D goes away when you're dealing with piece powers. Um, and moreover, if X prime, if X lifts to W2 of K, this is a ring of second bit vectors of K. If, in case you're not familiar with bit vectors, 
if this was z mod, if k was z mod pz, this would be z mod p squared z. So it's a ring, no longer a field. So if f x lifts to, to w2 of k, which is a condition that's very easily satisfied, then this complex actually not only has it become a well-behaved complex in the sense that it's OX linear, but it's actually as simple as it can be, namely it's direct sum over all i, omega i x prime shifted by minus i. In other words, it has become a complex with zero differentials. Quasi-isomorphic to a complex with zero differentials. So this, this isomorphism is in db of x prime. And from this, you can immediately deduce the, the Hodge theorem. So this is the heart of their result. So from this, you get the Hodge theorem immediately. Because what you say is that um, the Durham cohomology of X is the, is the global sections on X of this omega dot the RAM with dif uh, of X with differential D, which, um, of course, pushing forward does not change the hypercohomology. So this is global sections on X prime of F lower star omega dot XD, which is isomorphic to R gamma on X prime of um, <coughs> omega dot x prime, but now is differential zero. This is exactly what this guy is. And now, this is the point where things are not k linear. You're saying that x prime is isomorphic to x as an abstract scheme, and therefore these cohomology groups are the same as before. So this is isomorphic to r gamma on x, omega dot x. Okay, so this is how you uh, obtain the um, Hodge theorem. So maybe I thought it would be useful since many people here are not so familiar with characteristic P methods. Uh, it might be useful for me to give an explicit calculation so you see an example of how this, um, um, this isomorphism works. So here's an explicit example. Oh, going from going from from over uh, from knowing it in arbitrary characteristic sufficiently large, there's a very general principle that if you can prove something that uh, that is, you want to to show that a certain map vanish that's defined in characteristic zero, you want to show that it vanishes. Those are the maps in the spectral sequence. That's the degeneration of the spectral sequence. If, if, you, if these maps are defined sufficiently algebraically and they, are, they vanish for all p sufficiently large, then they vanish in characteristic zero. I, I think it's important to say it's not senior than finite, and so the homology is extremely important. I mean, all this was not true right. unless you're in process smooth over an angular yes. reduction. Because that's just true. They took the spectral sequence to generate at some point, yeah. and the way they do it is that they show that certain maps are zero. Right. By reducing the linear algebra over the finite field. Exactly, yes. Um, so, uh, okay, so it's not true for all kinds of yes. things, but it's true for all So there's a general principle which allows you to go from knowing it in, not in just one characteristic, but knowing it in all positive characteristics allows you to, go, to lift yourself to characteristic zero. All right. So let me do this example just because it's instructive to see this. So for example, if X is A1, of course this is not proper, but I'm going to only discuss this statement, which this statement does not care about properness. Um, X is A, A1, so OX is K bracket X. The absolute, from, uh, the relative Frobenius is a map from X to X prime, which is given at, at the level of, um, Ox prime can be identified with k bracket x to the p, so all the p powers in this ring, and this map is given by the inclusion of k bracket x to the p 
included into k bracket x. And then the Durham complex of x looks like k bracket x goes to k bracket x goes to 0. Uh, sorry, k bracket x dx here. It's the trivial one more, one, uh, rank one module. Where here I have um, f maps to f prime dx. Um, and as presented here, this complex is not formal. It's not, does not have, it's not obviously isomorphic to a complex with zero cohomology. But if you will look at these maps, k bracket x to the p embeds into here, there's not a problem. And this is exactly the kernel of this map. That's not hard to see. The non-trivial part is, lift is um, looking at k bracket x to the p, d, d of x to the p. Here I put the zero differential. Mapping this into here is maybe slightly non-trivial. Namely, you, you, ma you want to map g d of x to the p maps to, uh, I'm writing in the forbidden area, g of d of x to the p maps to g x to the p minus 1 dx. This is a somewhat non-obvious map, but the what you should really think of, this turns out to be a quasi-isomorphism, and it's very easy to check that it's a quasi-isomorphism. The part that's not somehow, so what, what I wanted to point out about the theorem is that it does have a lot of the flavor of the Hodge theorem, in the sense that here we have a cohomology group, namely the co-kernel of, uh, uh, of this module by the image of this module, uh, the quotient, and we are picking specific representatives for those cohomology classes. So I'm giving you specific representatives for each cohomology element in here, and this is exactly what the usual Hodge theorem does by choosing the harmonic elements in each cohomology. This is called the Cartier or the inverse Cartier? This is the inverse Cartier, yeah. The Cartier, the, the Cartier statement is that always, no matter what you do, uh, the push forward of, of this one, the cohomology sheaves of these are these guys. But the problem is to find an inverse map that, so you know the cohomology groups, but now you want to find specific representatives. And finding, finding this is only possible under the extra assumption that x lifts to w. But I want to emphasize that this is a very mild condition that will always be satisfied for any variety that comes from characteristic zero. So you need to find very pathological examples where this condition is not satisfied. Okay. Now, um, let's move on to the... Um, um, oh, now there's, another, there's a more geometric way in terms of derived geometry to try to understand this result of Delin and de Luzin. So geometric meaning. Namely, I would like to realize those two complexes that I'm trying to compare. So I have those two underlying complexes. One is the, uh, actually maybe let me not call those two, but um, the, the statement that I'm going to make is the following. That if I try to understand x prime, so I have two complexes. One of them is omega dot of x prime and with zero differential. Now, this is a complex that can be very easily understood in terms of, um, maybe I'm going to put an arrow here in the sense that it's very closely related to the self-intersection of x prime inside the cotangent bundle of, it, of x prime. So if you try to calculate the derived self-intersection of the zero section in any bundle, you, got, you, get a, um, uh, you get a complex that's essentially the dual of this one. Simply by like, standard calculation with causal, uh, with causal resolutions. This is, so what I mean here is that uh, the right-hand side is dual to the, co to, um, to the structure sheaf of the left-hand side. 
So if you just compute the derived intersection of the zero section with itself inside the cotangent bundle, you get a complex that's very closely related <coughs> to this guy. Now, this is no news. The more interesting news is the fact that if you look at the Frobenius push forward of the Durham uh, complex on X, this can also be related by the same kind of, in, of structure to the structure sheaf of a slightly different gadget, namely you intersect again the zero section with itself, but in a modified version of the cotangent bundle, where you take the cotangent bundle and you twist it by this D. And let me explain what that means. So in characteristic P, the sheaf of differential operators on X, unlike the characteristic zero case, this sheaf, this, uh, this algebra has got lots and lots of elements in the center, so has large center. In particular, the center of this ring can be identified with O of X, O, o of the cotangent bundle of X prime. So, this sheaf of um, differential operators on X, which a priori you think of as uh, uh, an algebra on X, actually naturally lives on a bigger space on the cotangent bundle of X prime. This is only true in characteristic P, and that's why it's so much easier to work in positive characteristic. So, <coughs> and moreover, this D is an Azumai algebra, in the sense that it's uh, over T star of X prime. And it's always non-trivial. So what happens is, again, in characteristic P, the cotangent bundle has got the natural twisting that is there staring at you that does not um, exist in characteristic zero. And we have a very good uh, theory of studying things over twisted spaces in which twisted spaces are, behave almost exactly like ordinary spaces. So we, in particular, we can talk about the derived intersection of something inside the twisted space. I will talk, say more about this. And the, the point is that if we do this derived intersection of the zero section with itself inside the cotangent bundle, which has been, if, if I haven't put in this twisting, I get this complex. If I have put this twisting, I get this complex. So this suggests that one way to understand the Lin and de Luzy's theorem is that somehow computing these two derived intersections gives the same answer. So the Lin and de Luzy tell us that under some assumption there is an isomorphism between these two things, the assumption being this lift to W2. And so the, the statement says that geometrically these two objects should be the same. These two derived intersections should be the same. Now, morally, why is that true? The, the reason that this is true is the following. Um, when you compute the derived intersection of something with itself, let's say, you don't care about the full space in which you're computing the derived intersection. You only need to know some part of the infinitesimal neighborhood of X prime inside T star of X prime. So now, for example, if you knew that this D is trivial on the formal neighborhood of the zero section, you, this theorem would be completely trivial because the self-intersection only cares about the formal neighborhood of, of X prime inside this space. This is not actually true, but something that August and Vologodsky prove They prove the following, that D restricted to the first infinitesimal neighborhood of X prime is trivial as an Azumai algebra. In other words, it splits. It's the endomorphism ring of a fixed module. Um, if and only if X lifts to W2. So from this result of August and Vologodsky, we can finally understand geometrically uh, the Lin and de proof. We, we know that X lifts to W2 says that 
at least to the, to the first order, the Azuma algebra is trivial around the zero section of, um, of uh, around the zero section. And for reasons that will become obvious later, computing the, f the derived self-intersection only cares about the first, the first order, uh, the first order neighborhood of the zero section. And so that triviality tells, and the fact that things only depend on, on first order tells me that this will be the same as if I didn't have any D. So therefore, this is equal to this. Therefore, this is equal to this. Uh, yes. The center of D is the structure shift of T star of X prime. I'm not sure. I, well, it depends where you think of this as living. I don't know. It's, it's not very clear to me. If you, want the, the, if you think of D as living on X, then Frobenius push forward of this is equal to the, the push forward of this to X prime under the bundle map. All right. <clears throat> now, I would like to do the same exact story in the, in the twisted uh, Durham case. And here's the, so now let's pass to the twisted Durham case. So now I need to somehow put my function f I somewhere in this picture and the statement is actually, so there's first of all, I need to generalize this statement, and that's fairly easy. So my function f from x to k gives, gives rise to a section. Um, so I can look at x prime, x prime f, which is the graph of, d do, of ds <coughs> contained inside um, the cotangent bundle of x, of x. Sorry, that's xf. And then do the Frobenius twist. Gives xf prime contained inside t star of x prime. So this just means I'm looking at these varieties of, I, I, I base change to the other k. So bef the picture is kind of like this. Before I had the cotangent bundle of X prime, and I was doing the intersection of two Lagrangian submanifolds, but which were completely trivial. They were both a zero section. Now I want to do something just slightly different. Namely, I'm going to intersect the zero section with this new section, which is XF prime. So my statements are the following, that if I compute, first of all, the cotangent co uh, complex of x prime, but with differential just wedge of df prime. This is related just in the sense that I was doing before to the intersection of x prime and x prime f over t star of x prime. So if I'm trying to just compute the ordinary intersection of x prime and x prime f inside the cotangent bundle, I have these two Lagrangian sections, Lagrangians sections of the cotangent bundle. When I compute the derived intersection here, I get exactly something whose structure sheaf is a dual of this complex. And that's coherent in the sense that this is an ordinary algebraic object. There. Everything is OX prime linear. And if I now twist things just as I was doing before, in that I replace the cotangent bundle of X prime by the one where the sheaf of functions has been replaced by the sheaf of differential operators, this derived intersection will correspond exactly to the Frobenius push forward of omega of x d plus wedge df. So the way you should think about this is that the cotangent bundle of x prime has got this continuous, if you, uh, well, it's not continuous, but think of it as a deformation where you go from ox to d, Quantization, perhaps, is a better word. And I had this intersection problem, which was fairly simple at first. I was intersecting the zero section with a graph of df. And now I look at what happens under this deformation. And I'm, 
changing from one intersection to another is exactly putting, adding the extra D in this complex. So I had the simple complex and then I went to the more complicated complex. And the problem is to show that actually what you would like to show is that with some assumptions, these two complexes actually, actually are quasi-isomorphic. That the, even though it seems like they, they have changed, they haven't actually changed. And we've seen one example in the delino luzzi story. The question is, what is the corresponding story in the, um, in the twisted case? So now we have a very, uh, a very concrete abstract problem. Namely, here's the abstract problem. We have a space, let's call it maybe S, a base space in which, inside which we're doing the intersections. And we have two spaces X and Y. And we could compute the derived intersections. So these are, let's say, smooth sub-varieties here. We're trying to compute the derived intersection of x with y. We, this is something we could compute. Or the other version is the following. Let's say that on S, we also happen to have a, a, an Azumaya algebra. So on S, have an Azumaya algebra. Let's call it A. And let's assume the, now I don't want to, to, to ask what does it mean. If I have an Azumai algebra on S, that gives me Azumai algebras on X and on Y just by restriction. So I could think of, a, of, of this space, X twisted by A. That embeds into S twisted by A. And that embeds into y twisted by a. And I could, of course, compute the derived fiber product of this. But that's not very interesting. That's a completely different question. I'm, the thing that I'm really interested in is the following. What happens if this a is actually trivial along x? So let's assume that this is actually isomorphic to the ordinary x o x. And let's assume also that this is also trivial here. So that those two spaces are actually, in a natural sense, isomorphic. So I'm really trying to intersect the same spaces as before, x and y, but first inside s and then inside s a. Yes, these are. Uh, so this is a non-commutative. Uh, all of the, so when I put an Azumaya algebra, yes, I have a non-commutative scheme, but it's mildly non-commutative in the sense that locally it is isomorphic to a commutative scheme because the Azumaya algebra loca at all locally looks like, an or like uh, an, a matrix algebra and therefore module coherent sheaves over this are the same as ordinary coherent sheaves. But generally, over here, it's only at all locally that it's trivial. And this assumption that the Azumaya algebra is trivial along the entire Y says that, the, that I don't, not only lo at all locally, but globally, this Azuma algebra is trivial, and therefore, um, for all intents and purposes, this scheme is the same as this. This, this non-commutative scheme is actually commutative. It's isomorphic to the ordinary Y. So the question is to compare the derived intersection of these two. So maybe let's call it W bar. So maybe equals to x prime cross over s a with y, uh, x with y. So the question is to compare this guy with this guy. W bar is a priori also commutative. No, W bar is not non-commutative because it's naturally a derived subscheme of one of these. So it's, it's a priori you already know that it's, it's a commutative scheme. However, it's not necessarily uh, the same DG scheme as this one. And actually, this brings me exactly to um, explaining why it's not necessarily the same DG scheme. 
<clears throat> so here's the point somehow. It's fairly easy to see that, well, so maybe let me try to say, to say it this way. One way you could calculate the fiber product of these two is just, sorry, this is A restricted to X and this is A restricted to Y. One way, if you, if you only wanted to calculate everything as being A-twisted, the fiber product here would be just you compute the old W and you, um, you put on it the twisting that was coming from the base A. And of course, because this was already trivial here, it's, you, can, you can pull back this trivial Azuma algebra here and you get a trivial Azuma algebra. It doesn't matter if you... So that shows you that this Azuma algebra is trivial. However, this is exactly the point that um, the two trivializations, one that I have here and here, need not agree on the intersection. So... that the trivialization of um, A restricted to W coming from the trivialization of A restricted to X need not be the same as that coming from the trivialization of A restricted to Y. So this has my algebra. So th this, the picture is this. I have a non-trivial Azuma algebra on the entire space. I've got two sub-varieties X and Y. I restrict my Azuma algebra to either to X or to Y. It is trivial. I choose a trivialization. But when I restrict to the intersection that gives me two different trivializations of A restricted to W, those two trivializations need not agree. In fact, we know something very specific that any two trivializations differ by a line bundle on the ambient space. So the difference of these two two trivializations On, of A restricted to W is a line bundle on W. So this tells me that whenever I have a problem of this sort, namely somebody gives me two sub-varieties X and Y of a space S and two trivializations of the Azuma algebra on X and on Y, that gives me a naturally a line bundle on, their, on the intersection of X and Y. Now, it will turn out that in the problem that we are interested in, <coughs> this trivialization is, uh, this line bundle is trivial in the classical sense. So if we don't, if instead of the, of the derived intersection, we think of, of, the, um, of the classical intersection, the two trivializations are the same, but in the derived sense, these two line bundles may be, uh, this line bundle may be non-trivial. So this will be essentially the Delini Luzi story. Yes. Yes, that is definitely true. If the Azuma algebra is order n, yes, I that see. line bundle is a. Is a setting the derived setting is still true. Yes. Oh, so that is true. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, th that line bundle is finite order. Right. Yes, in the Picard. But what I wanted to emphasize is that. In the derived setting, what we think of line bundles in the usual setting, that might be a bit misleading about what we think of as line bundle in the derived setting. In the following sense, maybe. So, um, if we have, so let's say we have a, a, a DG scheme X, uh, or maybe W. Let's say that W is actually uh, a, a formal DG scheme. So it just looks like uh, OW0, and plus 
some vector bundle E and plus maybe, let's say, wedge two E's here and so on, and with zero differentials. Now, what would the Picard group of this W be? Well, everybody knows that the Picard group can be calculated as H1 of W, O W star. O, o. But now when you look at O W star, what is that? That is, you need invertible elements in this symmetric algebra. That means that you want to have something invertible here plus anything in all the other degrees because everything else is nilpotent. It's just like the usual thing that... Uh, um, yeah. So that means that in particular in here, I will have an element of the form H2 of E on W0 of E is a, is a sub in here. Uh, no, here, uh, no, uh, no, here, well, W0 or W, it doesn't matter, H1 is H1. But what I'm trying to say is that you might have line bundles on W which look as a complex, the complex has the same cohomology sheaves as all these sheaves, it's just that it, it stops being a formal complex. It's, so. Somehow a complex which has the same cohomology sheaves. Uh, so one way you could get line bundles on the derived scheme is just a tensor with an ordinary line bundle from the underived scheme. But another way you could get line bundles is to take a complex which has the same cohomology sheaves as O, but stops being formal, which has non-trivial information in the differential. You see this H2 is exactly a way to amalgamate those two terms of the... Of the um, uh, of the first two terms of the structure complex. Okay, so now um, now we would want a theorem that would say that this line bundle that we have constructed in the abstract is actually trivial sometimes. And here's the theorem. It's a formality so here's the first theorem that, um, again, so now we have this situation, X is embedded into S, Y is embedded into S, W is the, 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 the derived intersection. Um, and W0 is the classical intersection, X cross over, uh, X cross over uh, S is Y underived. This is a classical intersection. Sorry? Can they give you? I, I, I definitely remember. Content, uh, worrying about this problem and finding. But we're in finite characteristics. Yes, exactly. That's that's exactly the problem. In, yes. In 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 po yes, exactly. That was the resolution of our problem. This is something very unusual indeed. You can have that H2 itself is torsion, and but it's only exactly p torsion, and therefore your Azuma algebras have to be rank a power of p, which they are because the ring of differential operator has rank p to the dimension of x minus 1 or something like that. Okay. So, um, here's the theorem. Now, I need a bunch of assumptions. Um, so, if the following conditions hold. First of all, um, w, is scheme theoret w0 is scheme-theoretic smooth. Second, um, the map from X to S is split to first order. And C, a, short, a certain short exact sequence of vector bundles um, is split. Uh, uh, w0 inside Y goes to the normal bundle of 
x inside z restricted to w0 goes to, let's call the co-kernel E, this short exact sequence splits. Um, uh, z is not z, z is s. So th whenever you have such a diagram, let's say in the classical sense, the normal bundle of w in y is, is a sub-bundle of the normal bundle of x inside s, and you want this to be holomorphically split. Um, then, the derived intersection um, um, over S is isomorphic to the total space of this E shifted by minus one. So it's as simple as it can be. All right, so this is the theorem. But the point is, in here, S can be either an ordinary or a twisted scheme. So the whole point is that this, the result of this calculation does not care about whether your scheme is twisted or not. It's, it's a clean intersection, that's this assumption. Sorry? X, Y, and S are also smooth. Yes, it is a clean intersection. This extra condition is a non-trivial condition that has to be checked. This condition B, you need to understand this. So star uh, needs to be understood in the appropriate category In the sense that if you have, if, if, that, if this is a map of ordinary schemes, then you just, it means what you think it means. And if this is a, ma if this is a map of Azumaya schemes, um, by the way, these two, the X and the Y, are, all, are always non-twisted in the sense that I had before. So I have X and the, if, if this is twisted, the, um, I need to pick split, uh, I need to, I need the Azuma algebra to split on X and on Y in the sense that now I can consider X and Y as twisted schemes, as untwisted schemes. So the whole theorem is that um, in, under these assumptions, this derived intersection does not care about whether you have a twisting or not here. It's always the total space of this vector bundle E, which only cares about the ordinary how X and Y intersect as ordinary spaces. So now... What's the link between those two boards? Sorry? You explained carefully the line bundle. Yes. And now we have so that, that's, that's uh, one way to say this is that the line bundle mm -hmm. is trivial. Oh, the conclusion is that line bundle turned out as being trivial. Yes. W under, this extra two, uh, under this extra two assumptions. So I had two different um, derived schemes. One was the, the one where I had no twisting, and one was the one where I had the twisting. The difference between them was the line bundle. And the statement is that if those two conditions hold, the line bundle is actually trivial, so they are actually the same derived scheme. Well, uh, sorry, there was one extra condition that I realized I had forgotten, so maybe let's call it D here. The Azumaya algebra, uh, so the two trivializations of A on the classical derived intersection W0 are the same. So essentially I'm saying that I don't care about the, I, I want the, 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 I have a line bundle on this scheme. It's, it has a piece which comes from H1 of O W0 star. That part I want it to be trivial. What I'm saying is, uh, is that the part that comes from here will have to be trivial 
if I have this extra two condition. Those two are fixed. That's what it means to have fixed the map from the ordinary scheme X to the twisted scheme X. Okay, so putting it all together now with everything that I had before, I want to apply this in the dalini luzi kind of story. So apply this <coughs> to the following setup. S is the cotangent bundle of X prime. X is now variety in characteristic P. Um, so here either with O or D. So I'm going to apply it twice, once without the twisting or with the twisting D. X prime is X prime. Uh, X is X is the old X prime. Um, y is this graph of the, so this is the zero section. Y is this X prime F, which is the graph of DF. W0, of course, is the zeros of the, the where, where DF is zero. This is a critical locus of F. W is the derived critical locus. Sorry? Yes. Yes. So I will need to put that in my theorem, yes, for this to work. And so now the conditions, condition D is automatically true. The, the two trivializations, the, they're, 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 I, I forgot to say, but the derived, uh, the sheaf of differential operators always becomes trivial in a natural way, both on uh, the zero section and on any graph of a one form. So condition D is okay. I need to assume A that, A means now that crit F is smooth. Um, and B is the so somewhat non-standard, well, the condition that I haven't seen in other places, that the embedding of crit F inside X is split to first order. Condition C is automatically true. And, but, so if I have those two conditions, therefore, I can conclude the following thing, that um, I recover um, the, and I need, sorry, I need one more condition. Uh, condition uh, B, for condition B, I need this thing, and I also need one more thing, uh, or sorry, actually condition, this was condition C. And condition B is that, uh, is that um, X lifts the, to W2. Okay. And so from all these, so if I assume all these conditions, which is, condition B is very reasonable. Condition A and C are often, sorry? W2. Yeah, W2. This is a bit vectors. Um, all this implies the following, that uh, first of all, R gamma I on X of omega dot the ram D plus wedge D DF is R gamma I on X of omega dot just wedge DF. But moreover, now I can explicitly calculate these groups and I can give you a formula. It's direct sum P plus Q equals to I minus C of HP on critical locus of F of omega Q critical locus of F tensor omega, where here C is the co-dimension of the critical locus in C is a co-dimension of crit F inside X, and omega is a, co is a dualizing sheaf 
of the critical locus of S in fact. Dualizing I mod. So I get something that looks exactly like the Hodge to the Ram spectral sequence in the sense that I can now calculate either one of these two things as a direct sum of just the cohomology of some line bundles, vector bundles. Thank you very much. Thank you.